Our next speaker, Mr. Shai Oster, is a Beijing correspondent for the Wall Street Journal. And uh, in 2007, he and the other members of the team won the Pulitzer Prize for international reporting. Their winning series focused on the tremendous changes in China, especially the booming capitalism and its adverse impacts, such as inequalities, pollution, and so on. Actually, Shai has reported China extensively. And uh, his reporting on the Three Gorges Dam was once the subject of some controversy. Uh, Shai is a graduate from the Columbia University School of Journalism. And the, in addition to English, he can speak very fluent Hebrew, French, and the Chinese. Welcome, Shai. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, it's both encouraging and depressing to see so many people interested in going into journalism at a time when it's at really a moment of crisis. But if you're going to be a journalist, Asia is probably the best place to do it because it's probably the only place where it's a growing profession. And let me just say, I speak Chinese the way a Chinese immigrant in Chinatown speaks English. Okay? So it's not, uh, right? It's. <laughs> In, in, in Beijing, if you say ni hao, people are like, oh, you speak such good Chinese. But, um, um, so uh, my, you know, I, I'm really honored to be here and, and kind of uh, in awe of the two previous speakers because their reporting was so uh, rich in terms of the data mining that you guys did. It's a very uh, hard, uh, time consuming, a lot of shoe leather uh, kind of reporting. Uh, and really led to big changes in uh, American policy and uh, contributed a lot. And it's the kind of reporting that you can't really do in China uh, because that data doesn't exist. Uh, or if it does exist as a foreigner, you don't have access to it. I was thinking our, my experience as a foreign correspondent in Beijing is very similar maybe to Deborah's experience covering the Indian Reservation. Uh, you're sort of the outsider. Um, the local government doesn't really want you there. Um, but yet sometimes we get anonymous tips, just like Deborah was getting anonymous tips. My cell phone number has been leaked onto the internet for whatever reason. And every day I get about two or three calls from some peasant someplace in China saying, oh, my house has been demolished illegally by the local government. Please come and report it. Uh, every day this happens. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, it's happened so much that it's no longer news. Um, but uh, and and so uh, very much feels that 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 kind of that parallel of of uh, a foreigner in a foreign place, uh, and uh, having this this duty hoisted on you as being the uh, somebody there to supervise uh, the workings of the reservation government, right? It's not necessarily you'd wish there would be a, a um, indigenous Indian press to cover it, right? It's the same way that I I, I hope and I see that there's a beginning of the the Chinese domestic press is doing the job that they try that that foreign media had to some extent served, but really foreign media isn't there to serve any other purpose other than my job as a foreign correspondent in Beijing is not to supervise the Chinese government; it is to explain China to my readers in America or wherever else they may be. Uh, that is my primary goal, and so that's the, really the driving issue behind everything we do. Um, but I'm actually my my talk is going to sort of range a little a little bit further back, and because my experience is very different than a lot of other correspondents in China, in that I first came to China back in 1998, uh, and I worked for the Chinese government. I was a, a, a polisher, a uh, foreign expert, uh, or a Waiguo Zhuanjia for China Daily. I'm sure a lot of you have seen China Daily, uh, and this was back in 1998. And it was a fascinating introduction into China. I arrived. Uh, June 7th, and I had no Chinese. I had read one book about China called Red China Blues, um, and I had really no idea what to expect. I had uh, a notebook with the phrase, uh, well, just in case I don't eat dog meat. 
uh, which I wouldn't have been able to pronounce anyway. Uh, and I walked into uh, China, which in 1998 is as different, it's, it's a different country from 10 years ago. Um, this was the old, old airport and getting, getting the line to get, you know, there now when you arrive in the Beijing airport, you go to your Citibank ATM, right? My Citibank from Long Island North Shore, I can get the Citibank ATM in the airport. Back then you had to line up and get, you know, they'd just done away with uh, foreign currency restrictions and it was just this chaotic experience and I remember driving into Beijing, uh, the, the paper had sent in black Audi to pick us up and you're going in through uh, this sort of mist shrouded night into what was then the outskirts of Beijing and the third ring road. Beijing today has I think number seven ring road um, and entering a world I had no idea what to expect. Um, China Daily back then was very different than it is now. If you open up a China Daily today, it almost looks like a Western newspaper. It's got paper, it's got stories from AP, it's got stories from Bloomberg. Uh, the stories written by the Chinese reporters are pretty, can be pretty illuminating. It's a good read. Back in 1998, it was every day there was a front page picture of either Jiang Zemin or Zhu Rongji shaking hands with the leader of Tobago or I don't know where else and that had to be the front page. Uh, everything we did was much more tightly controlled. Now, the China Daily uh, hired about 12 foreign experts uh, to serve as polishers, to take uh, Chinglish and turn it into something closer to English. <laughs> and um, we ranged from young people like me, I at the time was 26, I had just been a, a small town reporter for a couple of years, covering crime in a paper of circulation 16,000. Right, Yuan Liu, right? That's, that's basically a block in Beijing. Uh, and then I'd gone to Columbia Journalism School and I'd come to China pretty much, the only reason I came to China, I was thinking of becoming a foreign correspondent. Uh, I didn't go to Latin America because I will, sort of, I could tell that story had peaked, the, the era of uh, Contra and El Salvador had passed. I didn't want to go to Israel because I have so much, too, much, too much family in the Middle East. All my grandparents would be in my business. So I looked at Asia as a possibility of where to go and uh, looked around for easy ways in. Like, I wasn't just going to show up and say, okay, I'm a reporter. And uh, at the time, there was uh, internships available at Cambodia because they had just been going through the Khmer Rouge. Uh, they were sort of in this process of, of um, a reform and there had been some people opening uh, an English language newspaper that had an internship. That didn't pay. China Daily actually did pay. So I said, okay, 4,000 kwai at the time, the exchange rate was 11 kwai to the dollar versus 6 kwai to the dollar now, just to give another indication of the change. I said, okay, 4,000, you know, money, one-year contract, why not? And so that's what brought me there uh, to China Daily offices, which were drafty, run down, falling apart. You were using these antiquated IBM PC-86s. Uh, and uh, one of the first introductions when they bring me there, they say, okay, here is the black money market changer. Uh, they paid us in dollars because that was the hard currency back then. Now you'd rather get paid in the yuan. <laughs> um, and so there was this group of us, 12 foreigners, uh, some young like me who had kind of vague ambitions of being foreign correspondents. Uh, there was the den mother, sort of an older American lady who had been a, um, a copy editor of one of these small town papers in America. And then there were the burnouts, this sort of, uh, you weren't quite clear where they came from, but they seemed to subsist on a diet of alcohol sort of really hard-bitten journalist who'd been around too long and had come to China Daily to sort of see their last era. And um, it was a fascinating introduction into China because I had, first of all, a lot of free time to study Chinese. So I would sit between stories and cop and, and practice my Chinese. But also the, the, the people I worked with were, were incredibly eager to explain China to me. And at the time, 1998, you know, it's just, it's just such a change, right? Uh, no Starbucks. Right now there's a Starbucks in every block in Beijing. Um, there was still, the ten, it was also the time of the 10th year, you know, we're coming up on uh, 99, was the 10th year anniversary of Tiananmen Square. So there was still a sense of like, what's gonna happen in the 10th anniversary? People were still nervous to talk about uh, Tiananmen Square incident. It was also the year of Falun Gong uh, surrounded Zhongnanhai. It was also a high point for, uh, uh, WTO negotiations and uh, other instances. So it, it was still very, uh, very much a place of, it was more similar to the early 90s than it is now. Um, you know, the, um, 
our role there, as I said, was to turn Chinglish into English, and I kind of went in there with my Columbia degree and my American experience thinking, ah, I will edit your prose. And so people would file these stories, and they seemed to me really long-winded. So they would talk about, um, you know, the number four convention of pencil manufacturers in Lanzhou. And they would keep repeating the name of that convention as often in the story as possible. And they sort of, they would repeat things over and over. And I thought, gosh, these stories are so long. So I'd go in and I'd slash and slash and slash. And I'd cut and cut and cut. And uh, one day somebody took me aside and said, you know, we get paid by the word. I said, ah, I see. I'm, I'm basically, I was driving people into poverty. Um, I actually want to read uh, a piece that I wrote at the time. Uh, about my experiences there. This is actually my first story in the Wall Street Journal. This was from, gosh, 99. Coco Cola, uh, Marillian Monroe, and Elvis Prisley, spelled uh, P-R-I-S-L-E-Y, minority barbecue and homo sauce. Uh, Carnegie Concert Hall, spelled K-A-N-E-G-G-I, pop music underwear. Uh, these are not the scribblings of an inventive dyslexic. Rather, they are the hapless attempts of the writers at what may be one of the most maligned newspapers in the world, China Daily. Uh, the, official English, uh, the official English language newspaper serves as the mouthpiece of the Communist Party and is avidly read and readily scorned by journalists, sinologists, and tourists who can't find anything else on the hotel rack. But go easy on these guys. Chinese reporters face a daunting task, putting together an entire newspaper of sports news and features in a language most only know from textbooks. They try hard. They really do. At any given time, there are about 12 foreign experts. And uh, according to, um, you know, some of these uh, foreign experts have very uh, bizarre pasts. Uh, according to a, a self-published book by one of the foreign experts called China Daily Between the Lines, um, there was one particularly boozy couple who worked at the paper in the mid-90s, and their marriage was falling apart. The wife decided to leave her husband a truly lasting birthday present. She leapt out of the apartment window and smashed on the ground 14 stories below in Beijing there. The body lay there for seven hours because at the time all foreign crimes had to be handled by a special unit of the police and it took them that long to come. Uh, some of the foreign experts like me didn't know the difference between a mouse suit and a miniskirt, um, but I truly learned to admire my colleagues as I stumbled through my Chinese. Uh, at the time some of the classic malapropisms of my language was I couldn't know the difference between long john and underwear. So I would tell the elevator lady at the time, this was in, at the time all the built in, in most of the buildings in Beijing had a woman pushing the button for the elevator for you. She'd sit on a chair and she had a wooden stick and she pushed the buttons. And she stopped working at midnight, so you have to walk up the stairs after that. And for some reason there was a, you know, like all work units in China at the time, you had your office and right next to it the, there was the, the sushra, the, the, the dorm. And uh, unlike our Chinese colleagues, we had our own apartments. Uh, people my age who worked for the paper they were crammed in little dorms and would have hot water maybe two hours a day. Anyway, so I was very proud when I learned a new word. I would tell her, uh, I am cold today because I forgot to wear my underwear. And she would kind of look at me like, oh, okay, wet floor. Um, and, you know, the, the, for years foreign experts had come to China to help. Uh, the, this entire bureau of foreign experts, initially the Russians had been involved uh, in, in engineering projects, and then later uh, people from other countries got involved. and. I'd actually heard about the Foreign Experts Bureau from somebody in the small town that I, the gardening columnist for a small town newspaper. She'd actually been a foreign expert for a while. I don't know how she heard about it, but I, on a whim, kind of gave her my resume and didn't hear about it until I was about to go to journalism school when I got a call from China Daily asking me to apply. And I said, well, talk to me in a year. And in a year, I did call them. Um, and, uh, but it was really, you know, hard for these guys, these, these people that I was working with. Um, but they valued uh, the foreign experts, and at the time, the 98, there still was sort of unusual to see foreigners in Beijing, and let alone, uh, this is from a story in Shanxi, Pro in, in Shanxi province, that in, um, uh, they, their initial, the reporter initially had written this about the, the, the project in Shanxi to bring in foreign experts. In the year, we completed 70 brain-introducing projects and produced direct economic net benefit worth 90, 90 million yuan, from the province's Foreign Brains Introducing Office. I'm not kidding you. They actually, for some reason, the journals had come up with the Foreign Brains Introducing Office. Um, so it was the hardest time, the hardest point there. I mean, you know, dealing with the languages was, was amusing. And you could argue that, you know, come on, give these guys a break. 
they're writing, putting out a daily newspaper in a language that isn't their first mother tongue. If I were to try to put a newspaper together in Chinese, uh, it wouldn't even reach the level of laughable. It would just be something you cry over. But it became difficult at times when we had to do sensitive topics. For example, um, I was there during the time when uh, the Americans accidentally uh, bombed uh, the, uh, the, the Chinese embassy in Yugoslavia, as I recall, um, because we had an old map, which, believe me, is actually seems really plausible. No one in China believed that a country as great as, as, as the United States could actually have an outdated map and make a stupid error. I'm like, I had to explain to them, you have no idea. Stupid, you know, stupid mistakes are what we do in America. We specialize in um, And so there was this editorial that was written harshly condemning America for its egregious uh, crime. And uh, it was my job to copy edit it. And I thought, ooh, this is you know, the first time I felt that I was not just you know, kind of a happy bystander having fun, but I was sort of complicit in, in the propaganda. And I said, well, wouldn't you know, Clinton kind of already apologized. Shouldn't we uh, say something about that? Say, yeah, 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 later, later. We'll, we'll, we'll cover it. And, and of course, the, they, the, uh, the, the apology wasn't covered for another week. And that's because you know, China Daily is a government organ. It's owned by the government, although now they've kind of tried to distance themselves through layers of ownership. Um, but it still is a government uh, mouthpiece, and certainly much more at that time. And they were waiting. The ultimate uh, word had to come down from Xinhua. Xinhua is the, is, the, is the Chinese national news agency, and they truly are an arm of the government. And so in a sensitive topic like that, you don't blink until Xinhua tells you to blink, um, at least at that time. Uh, and that was kind of a difficult moment for me as when I felt that I'd crossed the line from, from merely copy editor to, to uh, collaborator. Um, uh, but I was lucky in that uh, no one, you know, my name wasn't on it and um, it hadn't held, it hasn't actually held back my career. It was interesting. A lot of people were, at the time before going to China Daily, I thought, geez, you know, working for the commies. I'll never go, you know, work for anybody else. But look at me now, I'm working for the capitalist, you know, mouthpiece in the Wall Street Journal. So. I guess it's okay in a resume. Um, but um, then I was lucky enough to go from, from China Daily. Uh, that, that experience, though, it, it gave me an insight also into the ways that, that uh, what a state-owned enterprise means. And at the time, even now, state-owned enterprises are very, very strong. But back then, the state-owned, before the late 90s, the SOEs were a really strong force in that they still had the cradle-to-grave uh, system in place of, um, you know, your, your, your housing was provided by your, your, your company, your hospital, your schooling, um, your, your lunch, everything. And uh, it was interesting in that what China Daily would try to do is they would try to incentivize the young reporters to be better and say, okay, if you work really, really hard, right, because they can't offer money that much and they're offering, beginning to offer apartments. So how do you incentivize young reporters in this system? So they'd say, okay, if you're, if you're a star, if you're just out there busting your hump every day, we'll send you to Hawaii for two years. There was an exchange program. And so, great. The trade-off was your two years came at a price of five years commitment to China daily afterwards. So what happens is these young kids would go abroad to Hawaii, have a blast, right? They, ooh, Hawaii, it's beautiful, it's pretty. Come back to China daily and sit through this, you know. And they'd, they'd come there with these bright ideas like, I'm going to crack open this and I'm going to write about that. And then, bam, you know, welcome to China. No, not at that time. And so their hopes would be crushed. And you could just see these kids like, you know, they were the ones with the dent on their forehead from banging their head against the wall every day trying to, like, write a story that their editors were like, no, that's not going to happen. But they couldn't leave because at that time, uh, literally, they could not leave. Their passports, you didn't have a personal passport at that time. You had a passport through your work unit. So they were they're essentially indentured servants. And so friends of mine, one guy who's now worked, worked for China, uh, for CNN, I and mean, literally, you would sort of have to like come up with an excuse. You have to plot for months in advance, like how am I going to get out of here before I go crazy, um, and come come up with a personal passport. You have to like find an excuse to convince the police to give you a personal passport, or maybe you tell your boss that oh, I need the passport because I'm going back to my hometown to pick whatever. This incredibly complicated process of, of getting your passport, and then literally vanish in the middle of the night. One guy vanished, left his wife behind, and just like took off. Right. He'd already arranged to go to a, a grad school program in the U.S. And his wife was sort of left holding the bags. Um, she managed to eventually join him. Uh, I know of another case where somebody uh, left the, the, 
the China Daily before their five years was up, and the, co and the company tried to sue his parents to recoup the cost of the tuition in Hawaii, but China Daily never paid the tuition. It was a cost that Hawaii uh, University System is, is sort of a, a grant, right? So it was pretty tough back then, and almost everybody I know who worked with me at China Daily, all the Chinese, have gone on. They're either working in public relations, uh, one person is doing uh, fantastic work. Uh, she has um, set up kind of a security newsletter based out of Washington, D.C. Um, pretty much no one I know is still with China Daily from that era. Um, f a few have, la have stayed, but um, to be honest, if you st I'm always nervous about people who are in the system, especially because the Chinese media is, is one where compromise is what you have to do. So from a Chinese journalist, you know, this is still something that happens now. You don't get paid a lot of money, so the way you supplement your income is pretty much every press conference you go to, you hongbao, right? It's the taxi fare, right? So, oh, it's 200 kwai to come. The taxi was very far, so here's 200 kwai. Uh, and it's just a common practice that if you have a press conference, and I've gotten the hongbao by mistake once, and I had to return and say, oh, I'm sorry, bu hao yisa, right? Uh, and so, you know, you see oh, routinely, like, guys I know who work in public relations in, in the mainland, They'll write something up and they'll just see it verbatim in the press. And then some newspapers uh, have, a, have a rating system where, you know, it's actually you buy an article the way you buy an ad and you can negotiate the rate for if you want on the front page or in the middle or in the back. And this is really tragic because it sort of, it undermines the integrity of the entire system. And it's sad because, in fact, there are some fantastic, fantastic journalists, um, uh, Chinese journalists really working hard. And even there were some really good journalists within China Daily at that time trying to do stuff on the edges where they could. Uh, it was interesting, even on the op-ed pages, there were people who, when the chief editor, editor-in-chief was out of town, maybe they'd quote somebody who was kind of a dissident, or they'd try to sneak in a little bit of an opposing view. Of course, now the China Daily is completely different. Um, it's, it's primarily driven, I think that change is driven by uh, commercial realities. So uh, they're selling a lot more ads. And they're competing. They now are. Uh, there's Beijing uh, with the Global Times in English. Uh, so there's competition. And so, if you notice, there seems to be a race to the bottom. Uh, the, the the tabloid aspect of the English language uh, media is is pretty astonishing. If you can put the, the the words sex, gay, and you know gambling in the story, you know it'll it seems to be okay to run in the press. Um, but for me, that was just a fantastic experience to really understand the constraints that Chinese people live under uh, being in an SOE. Now, of course, uh, uh, that's changed completely. I'll just give you a little bit of my background. So after working for one year at China Daily, I thought, wow, this place is really, really fascinating. Uh, it's just, uh, let me try and stay. Um, I'd learned enough Chinese to like not poison myself with bad food. You know, I could order my food, I could take a taxi could kind of fake it as a reporter. Um, but I was lucky in that I was able to get a, a credential. Now, back then, it was very, uh, even now, you, it's, for foreign correspondents, there are a lot of restrictions. Um, and it's illegal to be a freelancer. Uh, it's essentially, the way it's set up is that you need to have, you, you can't just be in China and write. You have to have either some kind of credential. Uh, and there are freelancers, but they're always kind of like, you know, you can get kind of these quasi-business visas on a six-month basis, but you, you really run the risk that if you write a sensitive story, you're going to get booted. And this was much truer back then. I knew people who, if you wrote it, like one of the hot-button issues was, was labor. You touch a labor, organized labor story, you're out. Um, but I was, especially if you don't have a, you know, because there you're actually on a, and they don't have you, they don't have to blame you for writing the story. They just say, look, you're here on this kind of work visa, and you're here doing something outside of the scope. So look, it's not, it's not a political question, it's just you're violating, you're on a visa violation. And that's true. So I was lucky in that I had, um, I was able to get a, a proper journalist visa through an organization called Bureau of National Affairs. If you get a theme here from this, it's unlike the methodical approach that you two take. My career has been based on opportunities and just being like open to, okay, this opportunity, that opportunity. So the different ways to be a successful journalist, one is to be incredibly diligent and methodical and one is to be completely disorganized and opportunistic. I represent that branch. Um, but so I had through this uh, something called Bureau of National Affairs, which is a very uh, technical publication that's um, primarily aimed at lobbyists and lawyers in Washington, D.C. So I was filing stories for daily tax report, food regulation monthly, uh, cellular um, 
technology quarterly. I mean, it was, it's stuff that made you go cross-eyed. But it gave me the, the protection of a journalist visa, and through which I could attend uh, all sorts of uh, press conferences. I didn't have to worry about being kicked out for doing my job. Uh, back then, though, at the time, there were also restrictions on journalists. Uh, 1998, foreigners could not live in any building. You had to live in a Shoa Gongyu, an, an apartment building that was authorized by the government to accept foreigners. And within that subset, uh, f uh, journalists and diplomats were only allowed to live initially in one building, compound, then it opened up to one district. But me being me, I wanted to live in the Hutongs because, well, it was a freelancer and I couldn't afford these official buildings. So I was living in some kind of uh, old neighborhood. And that seemed to work for about a year until the government, they were sort of, this is the Chinese system, you relax and then you clamp down. You relax and then you clamp down. And so uh, it involved, um, when they were clamping down on us, uh, there were a bunch, whole bunch of us living in this one sort of uh, foreigner ghetto outs outside the legally allowed s area. We would sort of get wind of the police coming and I would spend the night at a friend's house and then kind of sneak in the next day or I'd sort of try to give a little gift to the neighborhood police officer. Um, he called me once and asked, oh, you're going, I hear you're going to Hong Kong. I said, yeah, yeah, I'm going to Hong Kong. I said, yeah, listen, do me a favor and find out how much this new Nokia costs. <laughs> and I was an idiot. I didn't understand that he actually meant by him. And I came back, oh, that Nokia, it costs this. <laughs> you know, lessons learned. Um, he, he kicked me out gently, at least. Um, now, of course, if you're a foreigner, you can live anywhere in Beijing. Uh, and if you're a foreign journalist, you can live anywhere in Beijing. And I, and I credit that largely to the advances in surveillance technology. I'm carrying a cell phone, they can listen to my conversation. They don't need to worry about where I live. Now, um, I, I, was a, I was a freelancer in, in uh, I was working for Bureau of National Affairs and I was freelancing for a couple of years and then I went to uh, uh, a magazine called Asia Week, which some of you have heard about. And that magazine, unfortunately, uh, was shut down because of the great capitalist merger. AOL, Time Warner, and then I ended up uh, covering OPEC uh, uh, out of London for Dow Jones. And that was interesting because it was an organization even more opaque than the Chinese government. Uh, truly, um, s seeing, to really see a dysfunctional country, you got to go to Nigeria, you got to go to Saudi Arabia, you, you, uh, Qatar, and, and, and these places. Uh, I mean, Saudi Arabia is a great example of a place that's so rich, so rich, right? You see Bentleys lined up at night. And yet the, the highways are worse than the worst thing you've seen in Hebei, right? Like people begging on the streets. Uh, uh, it just truly made me appreciate that Beijing, for all of its problems, the garbage gets picked up, the sewage system works, you know, they bring electricity to every village. Right? There, there's a lot of achievements there. I learned to joke when I was traveling in Nigeria. Nigeria, there is a, that's, I, I, calling it a country is just a very, I, I went to Abuja, the capital, to cover an oil conference, and I was staying at the Hilton. And when I went to pay my check at the Hilton, they said, oh, please do not give us your credit card number. We cannot guarantee the safety of the number. Yeah, okay. You know, you can go and be, I mean, this, is not, this doesn't happen in China, right? That's the level of corruption. So a Nigerian told me a joke about a Chinese official and a Nigerian official. The Nigerian official goes to Fang Wen, goes to visit China. And he's uh, greeted by a, a black Audi, and uh, taken around town, and it's just amazing. The official has this beautiful apartment, and they go and they sing karaoke, and they eat lavish meals, and it's duck and abalone, and oh, this is great. And so the, the Nigerian official asks his Chinese uh, host, how do you do this? And the, and the Chinese points out at the highway and says, you see, for every $10 spent on that highway, I get $1. And he points to the new airport, and you see that airport, for every $15 spent, I get 50 cents. And he points to the new hospital, and we see for every uh, 300 million in there, I get uh, a kickback of how many million. The Nigerian says, that's fascinating. A couple of years later, the Chinese official returns the favor and visits the Nigerian. And he's greeted by a gold-plated Rolls Royce, taken to a palace. It's like the White House rebuilt. And there's naked servants, and it's just unbelievable. There, there are piles of cocaine, whatever. And the Chinese official, his jaw on the floor, asks his Nigerian host, wow, how did you do this? And the Nigerian official points to the jungle. And he says, do you see that airport? The Chinese says, no. For every $10 spent, I got $10. 
And that's the difference between corruption in China and corruption in Africa. Is this, this is from a, an African told me this joke, so I don't, I don't mean to pass any judgment, but this is how they perceive it. And I think it does point to a truth in that the Chinese system, you quickly learn, there's corruption, but it's on the margin. It's still a corruption. It's greasing the wheels as opposed to stealing the wheels and the grease. So um, now I want to talk to you. I show up, you know, I was covering, I had this experience, and it was really good to be away from China for three years. And uh, it was only three years, but between 2001 and 2005, uh, a lot had changed in China. Massive revolutions that in some ways we're only now beginning to understand. Uh, one of the stories that the West really blew and missed in China was um, the housing revolution. In 1999, Zhu Rongji uh, basically is the single, I think it's one of the single biggest wealth creations in, in, in history. When he said all this, up until that point, pretty much everybody who lived in the city had a work unit and had assigned housing and was maybe paying a couple bucks a month. And in 1999, the government said, we are going to transfer that housing to you uh, and you'll pay you know, a nominal fee, maybe a couple thousand. Enough that people, there was some money that people did pay, but it was very minimal. And that was hundreds of millions of people suddenly owned property. And the Western media didn't get this. We kind of blew it on that one because we didn't understand that what you had done is you had revolutionized the country. You had suddenly created a property class. You'd suddenly taken people out of a sort of marginal, I mean, it was, you transferred wealth from the state. Typically, it's the state seizing wealth from the people in China. In this case, you took wealth from the state and gave it to the people. And that is sort of, we're still seeing the, the effects of the housing boom began at that point. That was the point when suddenly people were like, wow, I got an apartment. Let's go Juan Xiu, let's go fix it up. And that's when all of a sudden, like, the whole, this new industry appeared, right, of the, of the renovation. That's when all of a sudden people had this idea of like, wow, I can own an apartment. Maybe I can own two apartments. Maybe I can own three, right? And the other reason, going, obviously, there's another reason why property ownership in China is so important is because there's health insurance and other types of insurance don't exist. So if you get sick, you own real estate and you sell it off to take care of any disasters that come, right? There's no other, you, you put money in a bank account, your, earning, your interest is lower than inflation, so that's, it, that's in a sense, that's where the private people are subsidizing the state because the state gets cheap loans for big SOEs. But, you know, but that revolution began with, with, with uh, Zhurongji. And also what happened is that the whole idea of property rights began to develop, right? Now people talk about, like, my right for this property, my right to this apartment, I want to protect my rights. I'll begin with that one movement. And I think that Zhurongji should get credit for being brilliant in this because he not only did he create a middle, a, a, a solid, a more solid footing for the middle class. He also created a huge uh, uh, um, lobbying group for rule of law, because all of a sudden these people have something to protect, and they want a court that's going to give them a fair hearing. The other thing that happened that really we're, we're we're still sort of feeling the effects of, and it's it's completely changed the world was China joined the WTO, and at the time what the Western media focused on was like oh, we're not getting enough access for financial institutions, and, you know, will, will Hollywood be able to sell more than 20 movies a year? And it was all this kind of like, you know, um, poker playing and, and, and sort of back and forth about what kind of access happened. But really what the story of WTO is, that was China's industrial revolution. And if you look at every matrix, that is when the entire world gave China its factories. It wasn't just Barbie dolls and electronics, it was everything. It was steel, it's becoming cars, it's just, you know, that's, that's when we gave it, we gave it to you, to, to, to the mainland. And if you look at all, you know, that's when China went from, from, you know, what, I don't remember, I forget what the number it was at the time, to now it's, depending on the matrix, it's now the second biggest economy in the world. It's now the world's biggest energy user. It's now the world's second biggest oil importer and consumer. It's all because of that amazing transformation, again, which I credit to Zhu Rongji pushing that through. Uh, and also that, that, you know, that, so that just laid out these incredible, the speeding up of the Chinese engine, right? You know, 1998, there was concern about 7%. And then after WTO, you were looking at 13% growth of GDP, this insane growth. So given these circumstances, if you can't find a good story, you're, you're, you're a moron, right? I mean, that's the thing about being, you know, you guys had to rely on anonymous tips to find a story. I walk out the street and I, if I get mugged by stories. The problem in China isn't like finding a story, it's sort of whittling it down and figuring out what story is the way into it. So you have to be, because 
You have to be opportunistic in China. You have to seize, you have to look for ways into, you know, basically you, you've got a tidal wave coming at you that is the China growth story. And you have to explain to the world that there's a huge frickin' revolution happening, right? People in America still don't understand. They still think of China as alien and far away. Where, where China is on your back, you're wearing China, right? You're, you're dialing on the Chinese-made phone. You're listening to music on a Chinese-made iPhone. You're logging onto a, a, the internet on a Chinese-made computer, and pretty soon even the fiber optic, cop, uh, fiber optic cable will be Chinese-made. And yet people in the West still think of China as foreign and strange and scary, which is, this is you know, just kind of funny to think about. Um, and so you have to, be, and that's partly that's because it's so big that it's hard to find a way into it. And, and you know, data is a one way into it, but you don't have access to data in China. Sure, you have the government statistics, and those are increasingly uh, becoming more uh, available. Um, but you have to get the opportunities as they present themselves, which is what we did with our Pulitzer package. Um, you know, one story, we knew roughly that um, water pollution is a problem. Well, okay, uh, how are we going to prove that? It's not like I can call up the Chinese Ministry of Environmental Protection and say, Freedom of Information Act, give me your data, you know. Um, they would say, send a fax and never reply. In fact, the first thing I had to buy when I was a freelancer in China, the most important tool as a Chinese journalist is your fax machine, right? Because you file a request to any government agency, send a fax. Um, so you can't rely on, on government data to, to get at it. And yet you can't base a story on NGOs because NGOs aren't reliable. If it's a domestic NGO, their professionalism isn't always the best because they're still new. If it's a foreign NGO, they don't have access. They have about as much access to information as you do. So how do you find a way to tell the story about pollution other than going to a village and saying, villager, is your water dirty? And it's like, yes, my water is dirty. Well, yeah, but why is it dirty, right? Is it dirty because the villager is dumping his own wastewater into the water? Or is it, or is it polluted because there's a factory upstream? Or is it polluted for whatever other reason? You need to be able to tell a story that is more than just he said, she said. Um, and so we were lucky in that pretty much every story we had had a kernel in data that we could latch onto. So one story is about uh, uh, water pollution in Fujian. And the reason we were able to tell that story is because that uh, case, had, there was actually a court case affiliated with this. So we had court documents that we could turn to, just like in America, you could call up the court. This is also some of the huge changes that are taking place, is that there is increasingly a data available. It's, it's small, but it's there, right? So court case, and the court had actually found that, yes, this local factory was polluting, and this barefoot doctor, uh, Zhang Chang, Zhang Chia, Dr. Zhang, uh, um, sorry, if his name I, I've mispronounced, but, um, so Dr. Zhang, uh, they found in his favor, and they uh, determined that the, all the peasants should, or the farmers there should be uh, given some uh, damages. But so we had all these court documents that said, you know, this is the pollution level. We'd sent in the tests. Uh, the factory itself had acknowledged that it was uh, polluting. And so when we did the story, you know, we had the data. And then we could rely on some government data saying, you know, broadly speaking, you know, this is where the pollution, you know, China is acknowledging its pollution problems in water, and so whatever, 300, like the, the number that, that China put out was that 300 million people don't have access to clean water in China. Uh, and here's one case where we were able to document exactly what happens, you know, and be able to tell the story of how this factory, we also were able to call up the factory and ask them, like, well, what's going on, tell us why, and then we were also able to rely on on government websites to tell us the story of this factory because the local government was very proud of this factory. We thought it was bringing in new jobs. So you could tell, the tr you could track how this factory had initially come from a big city. The big city had been working on um, cleaning up its environment. So uh, the factory had moved out. And this local town, wanting to attract jobs, invited the factory in. Uh, and so we were able to tell that story there. Um, Another case uh, we were able to do was on, um, oh, sorry, I just blanked out on this. Um, oh, the lead case, uh, lead poisoning. Now there, uh, what we were able, to, this is a story where uh, a smelter had relocated into the countryside um, and um, as a lot of 
in heavy industry had been relocating outside of the cities and being dispersed into the countryside where, where surveillance was weaker, where rules were, rule of law was weaker. And uh, in this one case, uh, uh, the smelter had been polluting for a while, and it turns out that all the children had, uh, some t hundreds of children had very high levels of blood, uh, high levels of lead in their blood. And it was uncovered because one child happened to go to a hospital outside of that county for an unrelated uh, illness, and the doctors there were just horrified, and it went, they went to the local press there. And so what was interesting there is what we were able to use is the Chinese media, which was increasingly becoming more assertive. In fact, it was Xinhua. So it's becoming, you know, it, it changed so much from back in 1998 when Xinhua would never or very, very rarely say anything critical to now where oftentimes uh, it's the, what's happening is it's the Chinese media. So initially it was a local media had reported it. Um, I think it was the Xi'an, one of the Xi'an newspapers had reported it. And then that had been picked up by regional papers and that had been picked up by Xinhua. And then we looked at it and said, this is a great way to talk about, you know, this industrial, the, 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 the cost of this industrialization of China. Um, and we sort of had to rely on some of the data, at least, on Xinhua. It's not ideal. It's not as good as getting the original source material. I mean, we called hospitals as well. We double-checked what we could. Local government we called as well, and they gave us some information. But you had to, we had to rely l at least on part of it on Xinhua. And on a case as high profile as this, uh, the working assumption is that they're relatively reliable. Um, obviously, we spoke to, we tried to talk to the factory, we spoke to, uh, and then I went down to the village itself uh, and spoke to uh, some of the victims and whatnot. Uh, and this was before 2000, I went that, did that story in 2006, before a lot of the changes that happened in 08. So at that time, 2006, before 2008, it was still uh, foreign reporters had restrictions on where they could report. So anytime you want to leave Beijing, you have to ask for permission. So of course, you're never going to get permission. It's like, hi, can I report about something terrible you've done to your own people? <laughs> yes, please come. No. Um, so you would just kind of go and hope that no one would notice the white guy wandering through the remote village. Uh, which, it's amazing. If you wear a baseball cap and walk with purpose, <laughs> you can get away with a lot. Uh, and in this case, so this village was in, Gan in, a, in, a, in a remote village in Gansu. Um, I remember the feeling of driving into the village and my, my heart was trying to leap out of my throat uh, and my stomach was going in the other direction. I was just filled with anxiety because here I am spending all this company money on a plane and I've hired a car and what if I show up and either no one talks to me or I, I bump into a local official and I get detained. You know, what, what do I do then? I got no stories. So I'm just like, okay, calm, calm. Practicing yoga in the back seat of this, of this car. And we, we hired a, a, a black Audi, and the black Audi is the official or unofficial official's car. So we look like from a distance, maybe it's just another official coming into town. Tinted windows in the back. Uh, every time we crossed the police car, it would kind of sink further in the back with the baseball cap deeper. And we arrived in the village, and I see a long line of Pajero Jeeps. And the Pajero Jeeps are the official car of the local officials. And I'm thinking, oh no, I've arrived on the same day that the local leaders had come to do an investigation. I'm dead. How am I going to get around this? So basically, we spent the entire afternoon on opposite sides of the village. And the villagers were so happy to see a foreign reporter come, because they're, they're, the, the, the assumption is, for a lot of Chinese, is that you're not going to get fair treatment from a Chinese reporter, which is really sad, right? It's a profoundly tragic thing. The, the way it works is your local media is, the perception is your local media is completely in the pocket of the local government. Your regional media is slightly in the pocket. So maybe if you get a media from a different province, they might be pretty fair, which is actually what happens a lot of the in, uh, big uh, investigations are cross-provincial investigations because you don't dare piss off your local officials, but you can go and piss off somebody else's officials because they don't, they can't cut off your newspapers easily. So, am I going on too long? Okay. So, um, so, but a foreigner, wow, you're guaranteed objectivity, <laughs> right? Which isn't necessarily the case, but that's how they perceive you. So they're just like thrilled to pieces. Yes, come. And these villagers see me, and they all have their 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 uh, slips of paper with the uh, lead levels written on them, and you know, in the 700, 800, I mean, you're, in the US, if you have a lead level of 50, you're, 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 you're screwed. And they're like, the, village, the, the local officials are here. Come interview them. And I'm thinking, no. <laughs> this is my one-way ticket into the back of a police van 
I do not want to spend six hours being interrogated by, you know, and then you have to write the confession, and then you have to stamp it with your red thumb. No, 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 I'll talk to them afterwards. Why don't we go into somebody's house and chat there? It'll be more fang bian, it'll be more convenient. We can drink some tea. Uh, and, that, and that's what I did. Uh, and then again, I used, I had the Chinese reports, and we had the name of the first patient, who the young boy who had gone into the hospital in Xi'an. And I walked around the village and said, where is uh, Xiao Hao? And uh, Wang Hao. And they said, ah, he lives down over that way. And you just were able to walk over and say, hi, I'm the foreign reporter. Want to talk? And the mother was, of course, uh, delighted to talk. You know, she wants to get as much attention to her case as she could. And so I was in her house, and I didn't have to worry about, you know, I think I waited until nightfall before I left. Um, and so uh, covering another case of, uh, of an illegal mine uh, collapse where many miners had died, in that case, I saw Chinese media already there, and I thought, okay, great, I'll be able to report if the Chinese media is there. So I started asking some questions, and within about 30 minutes, uh, the local police had me in the back of their car. And I was like, but, you know, they can report, why can't I? So you're different. Uh, that's changed. In 2008, in uh, the run-up to the Olympics, the Chinese government said, okay, we're going to open up, and we will allow foreign media to go wherever they choose. Without, all you need is permission of the person you speak to which is basically asking somebody, hi, can I interview you? Uh, and that's amazing. It's an amazing change. So now I can go pretty much anywhere. And there are, you know, local government is never thrilled, depending on the case. But you can much, you know, I don't get detained nearly half as much. Um, I'll give an example of the change. Uh, the latest uh, in um, Wanjialing, uh, this coal mine case that happened around the same time in the US, it was this big disaster where 20 people died. There was a big dramatic rescue of 200 miners in Shanxi province. And so we all flew over there to cover this dramatic rescue. And I was sure that the local government was just going to be nothing but trouble. And they'd sent out an email to all reporters saying, please register when you arrive. And I thought, great. Now, turns out that there's, there's, the, there's actually a department in local governments called the Wai Ban, the, 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 the foreign office. And their job is to deal with, with the Wagaram, with the big nose, the Dabidza, right? Um, I guess all foreigners, you know. My wife is black, so she starts calling herself the Dabidza too. It gets confusing. Um, but um, uh, anyway, so I digress. But so in this case, the local Waiban, they initially said, look, we've given out all the, the press passes, and we need the press pass because this is still an unfolding situation, we have hundreds of rescuers, there's ambulance everywhere, we, we just can't have you running around, you know, without any kind of, like, knowing at least how many numbers there are in case there's another accident, we just need to kind of have a, like, okay, seems reasonable, but they said, we're out of all press passes. I said, look, but I'm, I'm showing up with the Wall Street Journal, you know, we got some, we matter, right? I said, okay, 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 call me when you arrive. So we call, I can give you one pass. I said, but I got me, I got my translator, and I got my photographer, well, you know, I can't just have one person. Um, and I'll see what I can do. And he came up with three. I said, wow, this is amazing. You're actually facilitating my reporting. Then when we went to the actual mine mouth, um, there was, of course, police and everywhere. And, you know, I've covered, I've covered cops in America, too, and cops are never happy to see a reporter. This is like a genetic trait. Just as a genetic trait for reporters to ask obnoxious questions, like, why? It's a, it's a genetic trait of a cop to say, leave me alone. I got work to do, right? So, of course, they're dealing with the real tragedy, real accident. The last thing they need is a bunch of guys with tape recorders going, talk to me. Right? What are you doing? So, so they've sealed off the area. But then this, this, the guy from the Shanxi Wai Ban says, come here. And he takes us around through the workers' dormitories, in and out some windows, and sneaks us around to actually talk to the mine mill. So now we're actually talking to one of the first rescue crews that got in. Again, I was amazed. I thought, wow, you're actually facilitating my reporting. This is great. Um, there was a big question at this case that... Um, uh, some of the families were saying that there had been a lot of unregistered workers underground at the time of the accident, that the death toll was in fact higher. And so again, the local Waiban, the local foreign office said, okay, no, 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 let me give you the actual manifest, the list of workers at that time from the company. And he came and he showed us the list. I thought, wow, this is incredible. That said, when it came time to cover uh, the riots in Xinjiang, I was sent because in this case, being white is useful because you seem, again, like you're not Han, you're not Uyghur. If something happens, it's like, look, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on either side. When you speak enough Chinese, they get by. So I showed up, and again, the foreign government didn't, we, I was expecting to get off the plane and get arrested. 
uh, get, get detained. That was my expectation. In fact, the government had sent out an email saying, uh, if you come, please register. I thought, whoa. This is almost an invitation to come. And so uh, we arrived, and the all of Xinjiang's internet had been cut off, except one room in one hotel in downtown Urumqi that smelt like nasty wet socks, an old journalist. And that was where the journalists were based. And we were all fighting to get cables, but we were still able to file. Right? They'd cut off the entire province with this one link. I couldn't even, my, I didn't tell my parents where I was, and they couldn't call because international cell phones had been cut off. But this one link. So there, it was kind of weird. I mean, we were still facilitating our reporting. And I was wandering around freely for most of the day until I happened to, I was interviewing a, uh, I was on the northern end of, of the city near uh, a lot where a lot of the burnt out vehicles had been taken after the riots. And there was a Chinese man looking for the car of his father because his father had died. And I was talking to him. And all of a sudden, a SWAT team of the biggest Chinese police I've ever seen. These guys were like Schwarzenegger big, just enormous, with machine guns come out. They point their machine guns at me and said, what are you doing? And there's a CCTV reporter next to me. And I'm like, the same thing he's doing. I'm just here to, you know. And I, and I actually, very irrationally, I get upset at the wrong time. I start waving my pen and paper at them. What do you think I'm going to do with this? You know, like, you've got a gun. What am I going to do with this? And they're kind of like, well, you have a point. Um, they said, well, look, look, you know, we're sorry we overreacted. Just go register first. I said, fine, fine. So I, I went and I registered, and then I went back out. And um, sorry, I'm just giving you very granular details about how the, the, the texture of reporting there. Um, I went out again, and this time, missed, there was, had been another incident, the government had actually organized a tour of foreign reporters, which I had decided, oh, if it's organized by the government, I shouldn't go, nothing will happen. But what had happened is the exact opposite. Because there was a lot of journalists, uh, Uyghurs had protested around them. They'd surrounded the, that group of journalists, and there had been a scuffle with police, and so I heard about this, and so we ran them through as fast as we could. And of course, by the time me and my colleague had gotten there, that was already over. And we were being obnoxious. I'm like, oh, give us access, give us access. And at this point, the, 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 the Chinese police, and rightly so, were nervous, right? 200 people had had their throats slit, essentially, like two nights ago. So they were on edge. They said, look, get the heck out of here. You cannot stay here. And they tried pushing us back. And we were like, no, 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 you know, why can't? And they took my passport, and I was detained for th three or four hours. Uh, you know, there it's kind of like, okay, is it, they're interfering with my reporting. Yes, it's a very volatile situation, so you can kind of cut them some slack. Um, but it's a very different place than what it used to be. Um, how, am I, how am I doing for time? Because I can go on. <laughs> Ten more minutes. All right. Um, now, uh, another thing that's changed a lot about reporting in China is that it used to be as a foreign correspondent that you, were th you write a story and maybe somebody in America reads and goes, wow, that's fascinating, or, or what a shame, or gosh, they're just like us, or whatever reaction, right? But you walk around in Beijing, and you're just, no one knows who the hell you are, and maybe somebody in the foreign ministry reads your story and says, why did you say bad things about China, or you, know, you were fair, or whatever. But basically, you had no impact. You're just a foreigner in a foreign land, and, and that's it. What's changed now in the past two years is that our stories are widely, widely, widely read, not only by the Chinese leadership, which we know our stories are read in Zhongnanhai, but by the Lao Baixing, by the mass. Right? Uh, we've set up, we've established a Chinese language website um, that has about a million or more unique hits a month in the mainland. So we are now actually almost a mainland media in a sense. We're speaking to our Chinese readers in a way we didn't before. My Chinese readers know what I do. Uh, in a, in a, I mean, not all, obviously, but in a much greater degree. It's gotten to the point where once I showed up uh, in, in, in some mining town, and I said, oh, I'm from the Wall Street Journal. Oh, great. And this is the taxi driver. He's got, like, he's a poor taxi driver, you can tell, right? They have one tooth they share with the family kind of family, right? Threadbare. Yes, I'm from the Wall Street Journal. Oh, I read you online all the time. Okay. Um, so it's a much more dynamic relationship. So, uh, so for example, we did a bunch of stories about another story series that we did uh, was about the Three Gorges. And I'll give you a bit of the genesis. The Three Gorges Dam, people have been writing about it as potentially dangerous for a long, long time. And the only reason it mattered that we wrote about it is we happened to write it about it just after a bunch of scientists had went and gone and dug 
specific studies about the, the geo geographic, geo geological hazards and said, like, look, uh, this, was, this is causing landslides. And so what we, were, we weren't bringing any new accusations. We were just bringing new data to the table. Uh, and, and really just, it was very simple. It's like, go online, Three Gorges, landslide, Google, boom. S scientific studies that have been done that for some reason people were looking at one's angle and hadn't looked at another. And so, you know, just you always look, if you see the crowd over here, you should always look over there because this, you, you'll find something different. Always look in the other direction. Uh, and we did, and we, so we found something new. And we wrote this story where we um, talked about the, the landslides. And what was fascinating is it turns out that the Chinese media, very, very local media, have been talking about landslides as well, but no one had noticed. Because right now, the problem in China used to be not enough media, right? You would uncover a riot maybe when a local newspaper would be mailed to you and you would see it. Now there's so much media in China that it's actually, you have to choose where to look. Uh, and so when we looked, we found that actually along the Yangtze River, along the dam, there had been communities that had been struggling with landslides and had been relocating. And in fact, so we could actually pinpoint which village to go to to write about our landslide issue that was be backed up by the scientific data. So we went and we did it. We interviewed some locals, and it was great. It was easy. Um, didn't get harassed too much. Yeah, because this was after um, the local government came. Um, they looked at me. They kind of... They said, oh, we just need to register you for your safety. But they let me report. I mean, I kind of did all my reporting as fast as I could. And then they kind of had a, we had a little bit of a, uh, we had some tea. Uh, but it wasn't the usual eight hours of sitting in a hotel room, signing confession, the red thumbprint. Um, so still some level of interference, but it was, it was manageable. It was manageable. Of course, I brought along, because it was in the heart of Sichuan, uh, or it was a border between Sichuan and Hubei, I brought along some translators just because my Mandarin, I was afraid, wouldn't be good enough. Turns out that mo I understood these guys' dialect better than the translators did, because um, I'm used to like kind of figuring out meanings. Uh, um, any case, so um, so we wrote this story and we thought, okay, that's great. It's a front page story. You know, it's interesting. We did something new about the Three Gorges Dam. That's cool. And then we got another story, um, which was our story was being quoted in a Xinhua story. What the hell? Uh, it was about what had happened is we had, I th I'm not sure if we had instigated or just happened to be perfect timing in that it looked like the local government and officials and experts had begun looking more seriously and closely at geological and other hazards of the Free Gorges Dam. And they had convened a conference and our story was raised, I think, in the press conference afterwards by some Chinese reporter. And the Chinese official had said, um, although the Wall Street Journal has ulterior motives in writing this story, their data is essentially correct. And suddenly it was like, oh my god, this is the first time that two things. The Chinese government's acknowledging that the Three Gorges is not the most heavenly perfect thing ever. And we're part of this dialogue. We're actually having an impact of some sort. You can't, I mean, maybe, maybe we spurred, maybe somebody in the central government read it and said, you know what, maybe it's time to take a look at it. Or maybe we just happen to be perfect timing. I really, you know, I don't have that kind of information. But we were certainly something that was on people's minds, right? We were being discussed in a way that wasn't happening before. And so this story took on an, a life of its own. It just kind of kept producing more and more facets, right? Uh, soon after the government acknowledged this, this, um, these geological hazards, the local media began running gangbusters on it, right? And, and doing fantastic work on that. Um, uh, you know, Nanfang Zhou Mo is really, really solid newspaper, Southern, uh, Southern Weekend. Uh, it's a really strong newspaper. Um, and then the Chongqing government did us another favor by saying, oh, and it turns out we probably need to move another, you know, in addition to the 2 million who had to, 1.2 million who had to move initially for the reservoir itself because of these geological issues and others, we would like another 4 million or so to move as well. And so we had another story to write. And, you know, it was basically, it's not a forced migration, but it's kind of like, well, you live in a very ecologically fragile zone. You don't have a lot of job opportunities. Wouldn't it be nice if you moved? And, and we know in China, asking and forcing are sometimes kind of neighbors a little bit. And so we were able to write that story as well. Uh, and, and, and again, what was interesting is the way we turned that story, we found the guy is the courts, again. I love the courts. I, I, I guess maybe it's because I started off as a crime reporter in America, and I just used, the, the courts are just rich in America. You, 
you, you, you, when you're covering crime, you go to the indictment and you read this delicious details. And the courts here provide some of that as well. So we had, okay, we knew that the government, Chongqing government, had announced this migration. How are we going to find the guy? I mean, I mean, I can wander around the Yangtze River Basin and look, ah, you're being forced to move again? Um, but luckily, we had a case. We had um, a lawyer who had made his name in Shenzhen suing companies for worker compensation after worker injuries had now relocated to uh, Chongqing because he saw a business opportunity representing all the people who were going to have problems in this new migration. He was sure there's going to be a lot of litigation. And so he offered me a tip, say, like, oh, I might be representing somebody interesting for you. And so I found the guy through a court case. He lost his court case. Basically, this guy, his parents had died um, accidentally when they were tearing down their house to relocate. His parents, uh, a wallet collapsed. Because you were, the government didn't tear down your building. You were responsible for tearing down your own building. The reason you have to tear it down is because once the reservoir filled up, you don't want, you want to minimize the amount of debris and pollution and whatnot. So the government kind of, local governments were given money, and there's the question of how the money was allocated. But in any case, these people were responsible for demolishing their own house. The wall collapses on them. And again, we had court records on this to rely on. And uh, the two parents, uh, sorry, uh, the father had died. The person I spoke to had also been badly injured. Uh, and he tried to sue, saying, this is a workers' compensation case because we were doing work for the state. And the government said, no, you know, we, the court disagreed and said, uh, this was an accidental death. That's not the responsibility of the state. And we called up the local government who said, you know what, we really feel badly about this. And in fact, we gave them, we tried to give them some money and whatnot. Um, any case, so we found through the courts, we found a case. Now, it's not like I can call up you know, in America, there's a very big database called LexisNexis, which is a database of all the court cases as well as news. But also, it's, what's really powerful about it is that it has court documents. It's not like I can call up Chinese LexisNexis, right? There's no such thing. You need to find a guy who knows the document is where. But if you, you know, luckily there are networks of people that, that kind of, if you, if, you, if you tap into these networks, you can, you can access some of the data. Uh, and... Um, yeah, so now uh, our, our Chinese uh, website is so influential that we, we're getting blocked. So, uh, and the other side of the coin is that while as a foreign journalist, my experience is, is certainly better, uh, it's almost normal now sometimes to be a reporter in China, which is a little weird. Uh, Chinese journalists do not find it easier. I've heard people talk about um, that it's getting tougher for Chinese journalists to operate, which is awkward. Then it puts what happens is, you know, a foreign correspondent in Paris has no responsibility to France. If you're working for the New York Times, no one in France is looking for you to uncover the truth. They don't care about you, right? They, they care about you only so much as how do you impact, uh, you know, if the French government may care about the New York Times only so much as what it does for foreign relations or public perception of France. But it's not like a French farmer thinks, oh, I will talk to the New York Times and they will uncover the injustice of the French government. But in China, you still have this weird position hosted on you where people are calling you up literally every day because they can't get redress. They feel that they cannot get a fair hearing in the Chinese media or the Chinese government. And they expect you as a foreign reporter. They say, you bang wo man, you jiu them in. You get, help me, save my life. And it's like, dude, I already did a story about water pollution last week. I can't do one today. Your case doesn't matter. And it's a terrible reality, but it's true. It's not my job. But it's, it's, it shows you two things. It shows you both that there's a rising perception of awareness that I want my rights, I want my story told, I'm not afraid who's going to hear it, but that the media still is in this tight position where it can't necessarily report, doesn't have the freedom always to do what it wants to do. Anyway, thank you very much. Good luck to you.